Emily Dickinson. Presented by Sarah Campos, Alexis Clark, and Jacqueline Jones. Emily Dickinson was born in Amherst at the Homestead on December 10, 1830. Emily was born to Emily Norcross and Edward Dickinson. The picture to the left is of the homestead that Emily was raised in, as well as the house that she would later close herself off in after having troubles with her eyes. In 1865, Emily was treated by Boston ophthalmologist for her eye issues, and upon her return, Emily would seldom leave the family home. She would, however, have frequent male visitors. Emily was born the second of three children. She had an older brother named William Austin Dickinson and a younger sister, Lavina Norcross Dickinson. Among the frequent visitors was Samuel Beals. Emily and Samuel became close friends after meeting him at her brother and sister-in-law's house. Thereafter, Emily would write letters to Samuel and his wife, Mary. In one of the letters, Emily writes, Though it is almost nine o'clock, the skies are gray and yellow, and there is a purple craft or so in which a friend can sail. Tonight looks like Jerusalem. I think Jerusalem must be like Sue's drawing room. When we were talking and laughing there, and you and Mrs. Buells are by. When Samuel Buells passed away early in 1878, Emily wrote to his widow, Dear Mr. Sam is very near these midwinter days when purples come on Pelham in the afternoon we say Mr. Beale's colors. Thomas Higginson was also among the visitors. Emily and Thomas started sending letters to each other after Thomas had published Letter to a Young Contributor in which he encouraged and advised aspiring writers. It is said that Emily would send Thomas Higginson many of her poems and he would advise her against publication, the reasoning unknown. In June of 1869, Emily wrote Thomas a letter stating, Dear friend, a letter always feels to me like immortality because it is the mind alone without corporeal friend. Reverend Charles Wadesworth was also among the men who would visit Emily at the homestead. In 1858, Emily wrote Reverend Wadesworth letters addressed to Master and signed as Daisy. However, the content of these letters remain unknown since these letters were destroyed. Reverend Wadesworth later accepted a call to a church in San Francisco, and this ended their correspondence. From 1858 to 1861, Emily wrote what have come to be called the Master Letters, in which she addresses an unknown master with whom scholars have theorized Emily Dickinson had a tumultuous romantic relationship. In 1874, Emily Dickinson's father, Edward Dickinson, passed away. Edward was a lawyer and also served in the U.S. Congress from 1853 to 1855. Emily wrote, His heart was pure in trouble, and I think no other like it exists, to T.W. Higginson on July 8, 1874. Unlike her future husband or her daughter the poet, Emily Norcross Dickinson had little interest in writing. Edward sent her 70 letters, and she responded with only 24 extant replies. When her fiancé inquired about her lack of writing, Emily stated, I am simply that I have never ex exercised that freedom of expression, which I presume you have desired me to. In 1875, Emily's mother, Emily Norcross Dickinson, suffered a major stroke, and Emily became her bedridden mother's primary caretaker. Emily's mother passed away in 1882. Late October 1885, Emily wrote a letter to a dear friend, Miss James C. Greeno, and said, To have had a mother, how mighty. 
1877, and after the death of his wife, Judge Otis P. Lord, said to be an old friend of Emily's, began to engage in a relationship with her. One journalist call, called it an astonishingly candid erotic correspondence. Even with this being said, Emily refused his marriage proposal. On May 15, 1886, in the family's Amherst home, Emily Dickinson passed away at the age of 55. In Emily's obituary, her sister-in-law Susan Dickinson wrote, Very few in the village, except among older inhabitants, knew Miss Emily personally. Although the facts of her seclusion and her intellectual brilliancy were familiar Amherst traditions. After Emily's passing, her sister Lavina burned her sister's correspondence as requested, but to her amazement discovered hundreds of poems about which Emily had given no instructions. Lavina was determined to share her sister's poetry with the world and dedicated the following 13 years on getting Emily's poems and letters published. It is said that without what Emily called Lavina's inciting voice, we would know little or nothing of Emily Dickinson's great lyric poetry. The poem Hope was one of the poems that Lavina found after Emily's passing. We will take a moment to listen to the poem, and then we will break down the poem to find out what Emily was trying to say, as well as her style of writing. Hope is the thing with feathers that perches in the soul and sings the tune without the words and never stops at all. And sweetest in the gale is heard. And sore must be the storm that could abash the little bird that kept so many warm. I've heard it in the chillest land and on the strangest sea. Yet never in extremity it asked a crumb of me. Emily Dickinson was well known for using long dash for punctuation within her poems, allowing her readers to pause longer than what one would if there was a period. Some believe this was done to add a dramatic flair to her poetry. Emily was known for writing most of her poetry using the stanza rhythm. However, this scheme was not used in the poem Hope, but instead she wrote with carryover rhyming words such as see, extremity, and me. Emily also used repetition with using the words and and that. Emily was known for writing poetry using homiletic style giving metaphorical descriptions for feelings or beliefs, giving her readers something to relate to. Emily was able to show the meaning of how it feels to have hope within you no matter what, and that hope is always in motion and requires nothing in return. Another great poem that Emily wrote around the transcendentalism movement in 1830s to 1860s was My Life Closed Twice Before It Closed. We will now take a moment to listen to the words and analyze the poem. My life closed twice before its close. It yet remains to see if immortality unveil a third event to me. So huge, so hopeless to conceive as these that twice befell. Parting is all we know of heaven and all we need of hell. Emily Dickinson wrote mainly about death, immortality, and love in most of her poems. In this poem, Emily is talking metaphorically about loss and sorrow. Emily was trying to express that life is so unstable that it can close more than once without reaching any state of stability. Emily Dickinson typically wrote in two quatrains or stanzas of four lines each, arranged in imes. In many of her poems, Emily substitutes dashes for periods, commas, and other punctuation marks. However, this poem consists of two complete sentences, one long and the other short, punctuated with a semicolon, three commas, and two periods. 
Emily Dickinson lived in Amherst, which was 75 miles away from the center of the transcendentalism in Boston. This poem reflects on aspects of the transcendentalism. It also reflects many of the Puritan religious beliefs that the transcendentalism supposedly contradicted and replaced. Emily had experienced two traumatic events in her life and fears the consequence of a third. Emily Dickinson wrote the lyric poem, Success is Counted Sweetest, in 1859. On April 27, 1864, this poem was published in the Brooklyn Daily Union and later in the Anthology of Mask of Poets as part of a series of books published without the writer's names. Success was one of Emily's 10 poems that was published anonymously. We will now take a moment to listen to the poem, and then we will analyze the poem to find the style, theme, and meaning. Success is counted sweetest by those who ne'er succeed. To comprehend a nectar requires sorest need. Not one of all the purple host who took the flag today can tell the definition so clear of victory as he defeated, dying, on whose forbidden ear the distant strains of triumph break agonized and clear. The style of poetry used is the stanza style with the form of Einbeck trimeter with the exception of the first two lines of the second stanza, which add a fourth stress at the end of the line. As for the theme of the poem, this is found in the first two sentences. Success is counted sweetest by those who never succeed. Emily was making the theme very clear in this poem, emphasizing the word success. The meaning of this poem is to express that for one to really understand success, they must have suffered defeat. Basically saying that if a person who always succeeds will never truly appreciate their success, but those who have to fight for what they want are the ones who truly appreciate what it takes to succeed. Emily is able to express this by presenting images of a captured flag, a victorious army, and a dying warrior. Most people find it difficult to read and understand Emily Dickinson's poetry with her metaphorical descriptions and her style of writing. On the Emily Dickinson's Museum website, they provide some tips to be able to read Emily's poetry and have a better understanding. Here are a few of those tips that's listed. Tips for reading Emily Dickinson's poetry. Number one, stay open to linguistic surprise. The characteristics that help to make Dickinson's poetry so intriguing. The absence of titles, her dense syntax, unusual vocabulary, imperfect rhyme schemes, approaches to abstract ideas can at first seem to obscure rather than illuminate her meaning. Number two, read the poem again. Dickinson begins one well-known poem, tell all the truth, but tell it slant. The power of Dickinson's poetry often comes from her playful but potent sense of indirection. Trying to understand her poetry doesn't mean solving it like a riddle, but rather coming to recognize its slippery st strategies. Read the poem a third time, set it aside, and come back to it. Look at the poem with a friend. Number three, set aside the expectation that a poem has to mean one thing. A Dickinson poem is often not the expression of any single idea, but the movement between ideas or images. It offers that rare privilege of watching a mind at work. The question of how we know anything comes alive as we read Dickinson. Number four, don't try to make the poem about Emily Dickinson. Dickinson writes in the lyric style. 
in which the speaker of the poem is often referred to as I. While the poem may represent the view of the poet, it also may not. Finally, number six, read the poem aloud. Poetry is an ancient oral tradition. Often reading a poem aloud can help to elucidate its meaning. One of Dickinson's early editors, Mabel Loomis Todd, convinced Thomas Whitsworth Higginson, her future co-editor, of the power of Dickinson's poetry by reading selections aloud to him. Alexis, Jacqueline, and Sarah would like to thank you for listening to the presentation about Emily Dickinson. We hope that we were able to supply you with a little more knowledge on Emily Dickinson's life and writing styles. We hope that this information will assist you with reading and understanding what Emily was trying to say in her poems. We now would like to leave you with Emily Dickinson's longest poem, I Cannot Live With You. I cannot live with you. It would be life. And life is over there behind the shelf the sexton keeps the key to. Putting up our life, his porcelain, like a cup discarded of the housewife, quaint or broke. A newer Sèvres pleases, old ones crack. I could not die with you, for one must wait to shut the other's gaze down. You could not, and I, could I stand by and see you freeze without my right of frost, death's privilege? Nor could I rise with you, because your face would put out Jesus, that new grace glow plain and foreign on my homesick eye. Except that you, then he shone closer by. They judge us. How? For you served heaven, you know, or sought to. I could not. Because you saturated sight, and I had no more eyes for sordid excellence's paradise. And were you lost, I would be, though my name rang loudest on the heavenly fame. And were you saved, and I condemned to be where you were not, that self were hell to me. So we must meet apart, you there, I here, with just the door ajar that oceans are, and prayer, and that white sustenance, despair. <laughs>